and one particular crop, almond in the US and now in Australia, is transforming the world of beekeeping and of bees. What has happened is that something serendipitous came along that people found out, that doctors found out that almonds are good for you, a confection but it's good for you. The almond board got a very aggressive promotion going on for almonds. They actually, I just heard recently, send out sales reps to cardiologists at hospitals to promote the heart benefits of almonds. In a very good promotion of almonds, and it's legitimate promotion because they are a healthy food. Well, I'm absolutely delighted first of all to have been appointed to this professorship. The role is going to be about public engagement in science, it is about marketing science accessible to as wide an audience as possible, it's about making it easier for our academics here at the University of Birmingham to talk about their research to the general public and it's not just about a one-way flow of information, it very much is about dialogue. My current research at the moment is really quite broad. I work at the interface between the arts and humanities, particularly archaeology, but trying to find questions which are difficult to answer unless you start integrating computing and visualization so really I work in this boundary between trying to understand cultural questions about the past. But those sorts of questions that you can't address unless you start reconstructing, start modeling and visualizing past landscapes objects and movement of people. The World Health Organization says 12 years ago, India alone was responsible for almost 70% of all polio cases around the world. It calls India's success against polio one of the most significant achievements in public health. WHO officials say India's accomplishment proved the crippling disease can be eliminated in even the most challenging circumstances with a strong political commitment. The number of polio cases has decreased from an estimated 350,000 a year to 33, since the WHO launched its global eradication campaign in 1988. This waited Monday for the results of an election called a return to democratic rule, but which has been widely criticized as an exercise designed by Prime Minister Prayat Chanochar to entrench his military's vangle hold on power. Preliminary official results released late Sunday showed that with 93% of ballots counted the military-backed Phalang Prakarat party was in the lead with about 7.6 million votes, that's short of what would be needed for a majority in parliament. In second place was the Futai party of former Prime Minister Vanessa with 7.1 million votes. The campaign was marred by allegations of vote buying, however, complaints were few on polling day with election observers from Australia, Canada, the United States and the 10 members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations on hand. Millions of people in North Korea are short of food, perpetually hungry children, pregnant and nursing mothers are suffering the most. The World Food Program reports, South Korea's landmark donation the biggest in more than a decade, will help ease the nutritional crisis faced by 2 million of this particularly vulnerable group of people.
and an agreement worked out by WFP between both countries, South Korea will donate 50,000 metric tons of rice and $4.5 million in cash for food needs in North Korea. All around the world, significant parts of our cultural heritage are threatened by pollution, neglect, carelessness and greed. In learning the importance of our history, we come to understand the need to protect significant remains from the past so that future generations can come to understand their heritage. Dogs are not just man's best friend. Previous studies have shown that kids with dogs are less likely to develop asthma. Now a new study may show how, if results from mice apply to us. The work was presented at a meeting of the American Society for Microbiology. The study tests what's called the hygiene hypothesis. The idea is that extreme cleanliness may actually promote disease later on. Researchers collected dust from homes that had a dog. They fed that house dust to mice. They then infected the mice with a common childhood infection called respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. Heavy rains are expected to fall in a few weeks. Eight agencies are racing to shore up flimsy shelters and stabilize shaky terrain before the monsoon season begins. The UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, says the work ahead is monumental but preparations are off to a better start this year than last. Eight agencies last year had to deal with the massive influx of more than 740,000 Rohingya refugees fleeing violence and persecution in Myanmar. They arrived over a period of a few months, straining local resources and requiring vast amounts of humanitarian assistance. The World Health Organization says 12 years ago, India alone was responsible for almost 70% of all polio cases around the world. It calls India's success against polio one of the most significant achievements in public health. WHO officials say India's accomplishment proved the crippling disease can be eliminated in even the most challenging circumstances with a strong political commitment. The number of polio cases has decreased from an estimated 350,000 a year to 33 since the WHO launched its global eradication campaign in 1988. A waterproof drone is being used by Australian scientists to collect the highly treasured nasal mucus of migrating whales. The snot is rich with fresh DNA, viruses and bacteria, and is collected by a drone that hovers over the blowholes of humpback whales as they embark on their epic annual journey along Australia's east coast. From Sydney, Phil Mercer reports, whales, like all mammals need air, and come to the surface to breathe through a blowhole. Vanessa Parada, a marine biologist at Macquarie University, says that nasal mucus indicates the health of the whale. Life in the UK 2012 provides a unique overview of well-being in the UK today. 
the report is the first snapshot of life in the UK to be delivered by the Measuring National Wellbeing Programme and will be updated and published annually. Wellbeing is discussed in terms of the economy, people and the environment. Information such as the unemployment rate or number of crimes against the person are presented alongside data on people's thoughts and feelings, for example, satisfaction with our jobs or leisure time and fear of crime. Together, a richer picture on how society is doing is provided. President Trump has warned Turkey's President Erdogan that foreign interference is complicating the situation in Libya. It comes after Turkey MPs approved a bill, allowing the military to be deployed to interfere in Libya's civil war in support of the UN-backed government in Tripoli. The United States is to ban a number of popular e-cigarette flavors to the rising use of vaping products among teenagers. However, menthol and tobacco flavors will be allowed to remain on the market and large refillable vaping devices are completely exempt from the ban. The Democratic Republic of the Congo will hold an election in December, hopefully leading to a peaceful democratic transfer of power for the first time in the country's history. Sitting President Joseph Kabila came to power in 2001, having succeeded his father, Laurent Desiree Kabila, after his assassination. Joseph Kabila was elected as president in 2006 for a five-year term, and re-elected in 2011. Though his second term ended in 2016 and the DRC constitution prevents him from seeking a third term, elections were not held and Kabila reminder in power. might sound obvious that if you want to improve a robot's software, you should improve its software. Agram Gupta of Stanford University, however, begs to differ. He thinks you can also improve a robot's software by improving its hardware. That is, by letting the hardware adapt itself to the software's capabilities. 
as they describe in Nature Communications, he and his colleagues have devised a way of testing this idea. In doing so, they have brought to robotics the principles of evolution by natural selection. They also cast the spotlight on an evolutionary idea that dates from the 1890s, but which has hitherto proved hard to demonstrate. European market is a tough terrain for food deliberate firms. Delivery Hero has had a good traditional in the past couple of years. In August 2020 it ascended to the DAX, the stock market index of Germany's most unvaluable listed firms. It is present in 50 countries on four continents. Revenue for the third quarter was 1.8 billion euros, 2 billion dollars, a jump of 89% compare with the same period in 2020. We grew 100% before Corona, 100% during Corona and we will grow 100% after Corona, says Niklas Ostberg, the Berlin-based firm's Swedish chief executive. By number of orders delivery hero is more than twice as big as DoorDash, its large American rival. On August 4, explosives aboard two drones flying near Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro as he spoke in Caracas were detonated. Seven people were injured. Maduro has used the incident as a pretext to crack down on Venezuela's opposition by unleashing the regime's secret police. State Department spokesperson Heather Nowat said, the United States condemns the political violence that occurred on August 4 and urges the Maduro regime to respect the rule of law, exercise restraint, and safeguard the presumption of innocence for all accused. High staff churn is here to stay. Retention strategies require a rethink. In the not so distant past, bosses did not have to worry as much about their workforces. Newcomers could absorb the corporate culture osmotically. Workers' families were invisible, not constantly interrupting Zoom calls. Employees had a job, not a voice. Now firms have to be intentional. Management speak for thinking about everything from the point of the office to how staff communicate with each other. Retention is the latest area to require attention. The spike in staff departures known as the Great Resignation is centered on America. A record 3% of the workforce there quit their jobs in September. President Trump has reluctantly signed into law a congressional bill imposing sanctions on Russia over its policy in Ukraine and alleged meddling in last year's U.S. presidential election. Afterwards, he called the legislation seriously flawed, 
saying it encroached in his powers to negotiate foreign policy and hurt the interests of European allies. The company that provided the Venezuelan voting system for the controversial constituent assembly elections says the turnout figure was inflated by at least 1 million. The Speaker of the Opposition-Controlled National Assembly called on prosecutors to open a criminal investigation immediately. Executive Vice President of the U.S. Government's Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, David Bohigian and other U.S. government officials traveled to Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia in August to promote U.S. investment in those countries. OPIC is the U.S. government's development finance institution. It mobilizes private capital to help address critical development challenges and in doing so, advances U.S. foreign policy and national security priorities. On August 14, the U.S. delegation met with Armenian Minister of Economic Development and Investments Artsvik Manasian. Barred owls can be found in dense forests right across North America. They feed on small mammals, fish, birds and small reptiles, pretty much anything that comes their way. The barred owl grows up to half a meter tall and has emerged as a very adaptable nocturnal predator. Whereas they have been long thought to live in old-growth forests, they are now building up quite an urban population. In Charlottes, North Carolina, Barred owls tend to nest in the cavities of the numerous willow oak trees that line the city's streets. Far from being endangered, the owls have expanded their range, and now, in some places, conservationists are worried about the effects they might have on other native species. Almost everyone has heard of the London Stock Exchange, but relatively few know anything about the London Metal and Commodity Exchanges. Yet these markets have a greater influence on world economies because they set global prices for some of the essential raw materials for industry and food manufacture. The LME provides three basic services to the world's non-ferrous metal trade. First, it is a market where large or small quantities of metal of a guaranteed minimum standard can be bought and sold on specific trading days. Second, it acts as a barometer of world metal prices. And third, it is a hedging medium. That is, it can help traders get some protection from price fluctuations that occur for economic, political or financial reasons. An important question about education is, then, why do some types of students achieve success easily and others struggle to do well? Well, one theory is that there is a genetic reason for academic achievement. What I mean by that is, a certain innate, measurable level of intelligence. Another frequently discussed theory is environmental factors, such as the effect of home and family upbringing. A final reason is related to the teaching and learning process within educational institutions, and the way it is organized, administered and assessed. I'd recommend that you all try to get hold of English in the Southern Hemisphere by Nallon and Watts, as this provides an excellent overview of the topics that we're going to be covering in this module. It's really our primary text. It has particularly strong sections on the history of English in Australia and New Zealand, examining in some depth how the language has developed in these countries. 
The sections on phonology and on vocabulary will be invaluable when you're doing the written assignment, which I'm going to be telling you about in a moment once I've given you the details of a couple of other essential references. Learning a language in the classroom is never easy and, quite frankly, it's not the way that most people would choose to learn if they had other options. Having said that, there are plenty of reasons for keeping languages on the school curriculum. For one thing, a fair number of students go on to take jobs in business and commerce that require a basic knowledge of a second language. When you talk to young employees in top companies, it seems that they had a career plan from the start, they were motivated to find additional things to put on their CVs, and of course language is one of those added, but significant extras.